Hello and welcome to episode 85 of The Garden Log with me, Ben Dark. I am a gardener and this is a gardening podcast. In it I relate stories from my week as a head gardener on an estate up in the Chiltern Hills. I'm not in the Chiltern Hills at the moment, I'm at home in London on an unseasonably mild day in late December 2020. There's a fairly steady breeze blowing from the south and it's bringing us Spanish air, bringing us olive oil laden, warm air. So we can actually enjoy being outdoors for, for the time being, rather than using it as a, as a place to hurry through on our way to other pockets of inside. The week I'm talking about was one that began very, very cold, began in a miserable, frozen limbo. The hills and valleys where I garden trap cold air brilliantly, pull it down upon themselves like an anti-duvet, and lie beneath it in ice crystals. So Monday and Tuesday of this week started with a frozen fog lying about the place, the kind of air that coats everything with dampness and then freezes. At about two o'clock in the afternoon on both days, it thawed enough that the trees began to drip as if it were raining for half an hour and then it got cold enough that they froze up again. It was excellent conversation starting weather. Us gardeners certainly did not struggle for, for topics to discuss. How cold are your fingers? We said, oh jolly, jolly cold. Gosh, do you think this fog will ever lift? Who said that? We, we're joking. Carry on in that sort of vein until Wednesday when the fog lifted, everything thawed up and we had to go back to the more usual topics of discussion. Top 10 salvias, desert island soil types, that sort of thing. We were working under the trees on Monday and Tuesday, planting bulbs. It was fine to work. The, the frost was almost aerial, so we were able to, to get in there on those days. And in the rest of the week, we were sorting out some flower beds, moving around some of the forget-me-not layer, and cutting back or not the herbaceous perennials. There's a little discussion this week on Russian sage, Provskia, and I'm afraid there are further discussions on rock gardens. This might be becoming a, a rock garden speciality podcast. Perhaps I could repackage it and pitch it to the Alpine Society of, of Great Britain. I don't know, you'll, you'll have your own opinion once you've listened to The Week in Gardening. Welcome to the week in gardening. I began on Monday planting snowdrops, planting them as bulbs. So if you imagine a, a tiny little cocktail onion, something that you might drop into a very, very cold glass of gin, planting them in that form, as opposed to planting them as a clump of surprisingly large and floppy leaves once they have flowered. There is a debate in the horticultural community as to which is the better method. The cocktail onion method allows the bulbs to put out their roots in the autumn and to get growing nice and early. The floppy mound of leaves method allows one to see where the snowdrops are and to dig them out in a clump and move the, the slightly smaller clump about. I, as I find in many things, am not particularly partisan in this. I don't mind either method. I tend to find that if one has bought the bulbs from a bulb company, one is planting them in the cocktail onion stage, and if one has scavenged some from, from friends and acquaintances, then one plants in the green because they know where to dig to give you their snowdrops. I have no friends willing to supply snowdrops on quite the scale required, so I planted them as a massive order of bulbs from the bulb company. These are plain old Galanthus nivalis, the single flowered snowdrop, that little drooping bulb of white. It is not here to impress singularly. I am not looking for individual brilliance 
from my snowdrops. I'm looking for sheer numbers. If this were a protest, then I'm not looking for the snowdrop that will stand on a podium and rally the people with a beautiful, inspiring speech. I'm looking for the snowdrops that will be the, the million man march, that will be the sheer overwhelming numbers of, of white flowers and impress in, in that regard. Individuals, they matter not to me. And I was planting these snowdrops under some beech trees. This is an awful area at this time of year. It is muddy in the, the messiest of ways. Muddy as if someone had scattered the entire ground with really cheap powdered gravy, supermarket-owned brand powdered gravy, and then chucked water on it from a, from a height, and the gravy's splashed everywhere and then run a little bit and congealed. It looks horrible, and it's entirely the fault of the gardeners. Well, the directions the gardeners are sometimes handed because it is an area that is cleared of its leaves. We sweep up and blow off the leaves from under these beech trees, which means that the ground below is, is beaten flat, pounded as if with tiny little hammers by those unnaturally heavy drops of water that come underneath bare winter trees when the, the misty freezing rain is, is collected like a net and mizzle meets mizzle to form raindrop which slides down twigs and coalesce and form drips and the drips drip from the twigs to the branches and from the bough to the floor and then suddenly by the time that mist hits the ground it's a giant great big grenade of a thing pounding the ground flat and throwing up splash everywhere. It means that under there, the things that are still growing, the, the primulas and the emerging winter aconites, those lovely tender leaves, and the, the green shark's noses, you know, those pointed noses of the daffodils, all of them are caked in this horrible skirt of, of dark, gritty, splashed-on mud. It's really, it's really disappointing to look at, and it shouldn't happen. It doesn't happen in natural woods. In a natural wood, there's a crash mat. The trees modestly cover their ground with their own fallen leaves. And the leaves catch the, the big hand grenade drops in little russet cups, little bomb disposal cups. And they spill them softly and gently onto the soil. And you can brush them aside and the, the primulas are there. The daffodils look as clean and pure as something grown in a laboratory under those leaves. They look like computer-generated plants, whereas these mud-spattered things that, that we have under these trees, they're, they're pretty grim-dark. They're, they're pretty awful. You wouldn't, you wouldn't want them in an escapist computer game. It would remind you too much of reality. It's one of those annoying situations where a quest and a need for cleanliness has left us dirtier than we would have been. I think this every year while, while we clear up the leaves, that I'd much rather look at a carpet of, of slowly decaying cells than this panned flat mudscape with its soiled plants and... Oh dear. I also know which one I'd like to walk over, but still, we clean them anyway, like those, those hygiene obsessives who make themselves and their children vulnerable to, to germs by, by moving any particle smaller than a... Than a tick. This is not to say that there is there is no argument for cleaning whatsoever. I was reading last night, sorry this is a bit of a digression, but I was reading last night about the the water companies of early Victorian London when they were when they were working out who was going to extract water from where and pump it to wherever. And our area was serviced by the Vauxhall Water Company and a doctor did an experiment where he tied a piece of gauze over one of the standpipes and left it there for a day and managed to find enough rat and cat and dead dog hair to fill a whole egg cup because of the the water supply was coming directly from the Thames. I also found out that standpipes took so long to take off because landlords wouldn't plumb in their homes because it was a, a sort of tradition in these parts that, that when you were evicted from your house you, you took all the lead pipes with you st strapped over your shoulder. Anyway, that's... um. Nothing to do with gardening at all, but 
sometimes sometimes cleaning is good in this in this instance cleaning is not so good but but I went round under there anyway and, and planted the the snowdrops by the time the snowdrops are out the aconites will have their their foliage fully out at least and somehow it, it tends to mitigate the effect a little bit if you have a carpet or ground cover it plays the same role as those leaves and you don't get such a such a horrible moraine I think I put in about 3,000 bulbs, and they're, they're going to be a starter population. They're hopefully going to be happy enough down there and seed around, form their own clumps. And maybe in a few years' time, we will be the kind of people who, who turn up with sackfuls of, of carrier bags full of snowdrops in the green. I once went to my in-law's house with a little bag of snowdrops in the green that I had dug up from the, the Garden Museum garden in London when I was working there. I don't know what we were doing to an area that meant I had to take these, these scarce and scant bulbs from the centre of London right by the river. And I took them up to, to Herefordshire, to their house, and all you could see out of their windows were, were snowdrop leaves. Snowdrop leaf after snowdrop leaf after snowdrop leaf. And um, I diligently planted them anyway in a little section of, of the garden. So there is, there is a cockney patch somewhere there. Anyway, that's something to look forward to in the, in the future of this garden. On Tuesday, I was planting bulbs again. I was planting tulips, and I was also planting daffodils. Far too late, of course, to be planting daffodils. You're supposed to plant your daffodils in September, and your tulips in November, and yet here they are all being planted in December, which happens, I'm sure, to, to many gardeners. And I think that for us, it does us well. I think that I have mentioned on this podcast before that this garden has a particularly benign population of squirrels who do scamper around and they look very picturesque when you're the first person in the garden and they will scatter like, like things from a Disney cartoon. But they don't eat our bulbs. And I think they don't eat the bulbs because I plant so late that they don't discover the bulbs while they're burying the acorns. The acorns are long, long gone. And I think that most squirrel bulb encounters come from squirrels scuffling around to, to put their acorns in the ground, uncovering a newly planted tulip by one of those diligent early gardening types, and thinking, I'll have a nibble, I'll see what it's like. And then suddenly they've learned the taste, and they're addicts. My squirrels have never had the chance because their bulbs don't go in until December. And they're not really messing around with the acorns yet. It's not time to dig them up. By the time they start digging the acorns up, the bulbs will have little roots on them. So we get away with it. It was good to have a full day of bulb planting. After weeks of dealing with landscaping materials and digging trenches with machines and diggers and, and using pneumatic breakers and angle grinders and generally behaving exactly like a landscaper. An eight-hour day in the bulb hole requires a certain strength of back, but more importantly, it requires a strength of mind. It requires imagination, that most human characteristic. This is why. This is why animals would never make a head gardener. Eight hours planting bulbs requires you to live in a fantasy of spring. You need to be picturing what they will look like at every moment. Otherwise, you just throw down the trowel. All of this living in the moment, appreciating what's around you. Appreciate what's around you. Appreciate the fact that your fingers are freezing cold and you've done the same essential job for the last... 45 minutes up down up down and there's a cup of tea but it's still it's still an hour and a half away how can you live in that moment what's the point of living in that moment instead you have to live in in next april it's like working any job i suppose you just spend tuesday mid-morning living in next saturday and that's that's what i did on the bobs picturing the, the, the fantastic displays that we are going to get when when spring comes around again on Wednesday, I ventured into the borders. I was splitting up some of those rafts of forget-me-nots, the, the self-seeded forests that you get when forget-me-nots are happy. 
And this was partially to give the ones left behind space and partially to, to spread them further throughout the garden. They're such a good bedding style plant to have that blue furs so early in the year. They go so well with tulips, they go so well with daffodils, they go so well with lovely cream primroses. Every garden should have as many as possible. And they're so easy, you just pluck out from the areas you don't want them. I, I like to do them after the bulbs are in because you get the bulbs in, then you get the forget-me-not layer on top between the, the herbaceous perennials. You might have to cut some of your herbaceous perennials back for this, by the way. This isn't a technique that works very well if you're going for a, a trendy, I'm going to leave everything standing up through the winter, leave all seed heads in place. If you are gardening much more intensively like we are with, with layers of, of bulbs, followed by annuals and biennials, and then the perennial stuff coming back, then unfortunately you're going to have to, to cut back a little bit. Anyway, I was I was putting that that raft in place, and then it's just a layer of of composted bark or or riddled homemade compost, and the beds are ready and primed for for next spring, and summer. The borders are looking pretty wintry. We leave as much of the seed heads as we can, so we have seed heads knocking about out there. We have lots of, of the flow mists and things. The Porovskia stems are looking particularly magnificent at the moment. This is the best Porovskia time of year. Porovskia is the, the Russian sage, and it makes one think of Russia. Just the name. Um, it makes you think of cold and, and snow and, and Dr. Zhivago, that kind of stuff. And it's... Um, it's it's a little inconspicuous blue flowered thing. You can see how it's in the in the sage and salvia family, but it doesn't doesn't do wonders during during the summer in the midst of a border. But in winter the stems are this beautiful skeletal white, and they're rigid and upright with with side branches off at at perfect forty five degree angles. And once the clump is happy. They are, are so numerous that from a distance they look like a cloud of powdered chalk blowing over the garden. Really useful things to, to have for this time of year. Anyway, those weren't cut back, but they did have forget-me-nots shoved around their, their feet. And on Friday, back in familiar territory, moving rocks around... To, to complement my work, I was actually reading a Reginald Farrer. I don't know if many of you have read him. He's the, the greatest writer on rock gardens generally. He's a brilliant, brilliant writer, full stop. Loved alpine plants. Very, very interesting man. And he has a couple of, of pointers on how to do rock gardens right and how to do rock gardens wrong, specifically in the arrangement of the rocks. And he, he has two two traps that the wary gardener must avoid, both of which have certainly been seen in this garden. One he calls the plum bun system, and that's to have lots of smooth rocks dotted out of the slope, like perfect boils upon a cheek. And the other he calls the almond pudding system, which is a collection of spiky spires like the end of a medieval mace and it's a very interesting window into the the late victorian pudding world i think that that obviously a plum bun i've never eaten one but one can imagine what a, a sweetened bun with half of plum sticking out of it at various points would look like and an almond pudding i think the almonds must be set on their curved end with their points sticking straight up in the air sounds very very delicious but not for the garden certainly not Reginald says that one is not aiming to imitate nature. One is aiming to give the impression of a landscape, not, not, not produce a perfect facsimile of one. And I think he's completely, completely right in this. It's, this. it's the heart of Japanese gardening, isn't it? The way that two perfectly placed rocks can be a whole mountain range. And Farrah understands this. He, he knows that if you go out and copy a bit of the landscape, you find plenty of uniform granite pavements that look absurdly humanly constructed. Look at the Giant's Causeway or something like that. 
And you also find absurdly dramatic ranges of limestone pillars that you would say, oh, come on, pull the other one if you found them in a garden in the Chilterns. But, but no, they were, they were created by nature. Um, instead, we must nod to, to these topographical features. We must, we must give a hint of the giant's causeway, but use three flat-topped rocks near each other and um we can do we can do those dramatic spires but we'll do we'll do a couple of them and we'll put some fluff around the bottom we'll put some some alcamilla nearby it's um it's like that wonderful garden at chelsea a couple of years ago the welcome to yorkshire garden that was supposedly a chunk of yorkshire hacked out and transported to the side of the the Thames, but of course it wasn't. Of course it wasn't. It was. It was nonsense. It was. It was a complete confection and a distillation of Yorkshire. A chunk of Yorkshire might have been a, a car park in Leeds. This was a distillation of all of our ideas of the best of Yorkshire, and it was all the the better for that. So that's what I was trying to do with with my rocks on Friday. It's a very useful point, though, I think to bear in mind that we don't want to recreate nature. I don't want to recreate the American prairie in my prairie garden. I want to recreate the emotions of the American prairie. I don't want to create a, a Greek hillside in the Mediterranean bit. I want to create the feelings of being on a Greek hillside. Hopefully I am succeeding in some of these endeavours. We'll have to wait really, until, until the planting comes up and, and blends with the stone. For the time being, I'm, I'm very pleased, and I don't think there's much almond pudding or, or, or plum buns anywhere in the garden now. But enough of that. Let's see if I have any recommendations. I do have some recommendations, and I, I must warn you that it is more Reginald Farrer, so if you if you are sick of him, then, then feel free to, to skip to the, to the end of music. And I'll see you next year. But um, if you want to hear some more, Reginald, then, then come with me. Only one recommendation this week. And that is a very slim biography of the aforementioned Reginald Farrer. It's called A Rage for Rock Gardening, and it is by Nicola Schulman. And I'm afraid that that title really doesn't do it justice. A Rage for Rock Gardening places it into the category of a pretty standard gardening biography of the type that many of us have read and enjoyed but not really taken much away from. The kind of book that lists 15 years as a foreman in the Reading Parks Department before moving on to assistant manager in the Reading Parks Department and then a list of every single purchase ever made by this particular horticultural entity, all of their letters to, to growers and a list of their medals won at various society awards. Nicholas Schumann avoids all this and approaches the, the biography more as one would expect to find in the biography of a writer or, or a poet or a, a musician or a philosopher. Someone who it is expected that things will be written about them again. So the author has to do a new take, has to attempt some daring act of psychoanalysis, has to pin their writings on an incident in childhood, on a various, on some sort of defining character flaw, a piece of more speculative and literary work, which I found really fun in a gardening book. So it is all about Reginald Farrer's eccentricities, his quirks, his, his meanness of tongue, his brilliance of mind, and his thwarted ambitions, he, the way he was ignored by the literary world and ignored by his brilliant and beautiful friends. It is a tragic story, but one absolutely beautifully written. And what's more, for all Farrah's faults, 
the Klitsch woman recognizes that he himself was a brilliant writer and that he essentially created modern garden writing. And by modern garden writing, I mean from Vita Sackville West onwards. I mean Christopher Lloyd. I mean this podcast. It was Farah who began to give plants personality in his writing, who began to write as if he were particularly offended or delighted or let down by, by the characteristic of a, a particular plant. It's something that has become so ingrained in the way that we see plants depicted in the garden media now that we, we almost forget that it wasn't there in the writings of, of Repton or or louder. We can't imagine those great figures calling plants capricious little beasts as as Christopher Lloyd might or remarking archly on their, their temperament as Peter Sackville West might do. So if you're looking for something good and quick to read, it's only 120 pages long, or to give as a little gift this Christmas, then I thoroughly recommend that. I would like to say a great big thank you to Ellie, to Zoe P, to Eileen Charnley, and to my anonymous supporter, who all gave donations on Ko-Fi between last podcast and this. Your support is much appreciated. Thank you very much. And thank you very much to everyone else who has listened. It has been a strange old year for everyone, but I can say that the garden looks better now than it did at this time last year. And I think it will look better in January than it did last January, and better in February than it did in the February before that. And although that might seem of no real value and benefit to the wider world, it is something that the listeners here can share in, because it does help having this podcast, having you all to talk to. It helps me to do more interesting things in the garden, to to try new plants that I might not have done because there's a chance to talk about them on the podcast. So thank you very much for that. You have been a part of, of creating something beautiful this year, and you will continue to be integral to it next year. I'd like to wish you all a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year, and I will be back with episode 86 of The Garden Log in January. Until then, have a wonderful time, whether you manage to do any gardening or not. Thank you for listening, and goodbye. Goodbye.